Hello, I've had a request to talk about equiangular strain gauge rosettes, and uh, I think that's probably a good idea, so let's do that. Um, when I talk about an equiangular strain gauge rosette, that's not a name that gets used very often. Um, so remember, strain gauge rosettes are three gauges, and they can be set at any angle with respect to one another. An equiangular rosette is one where the angles between them are equal, and that means they're going to be 120 degrees apart. Okay, well, the purple isn't working very well. Let's just use the blue. Okay, that's what I mean when I say an equiangular strain gauge. There's 120 degrees apart, and I'm going to call these A, B, and C. Okay, now the big picture here is let's say we've put a strain gauge rosette on some part and applied a load to it, and we've measured strains. We'll have measured, okay, let's do this. We'll measure. Epsilon A, Epsilon B, and Epsilon C, okay? Well, we don't necessarily want to know those. We want to know uh, Epsilon X, Epsilon Y, and Gamma XY. Well, why is that? Well, we don't pick these angles usually to analyze with. We, we pick coordinate systems that are convenient. Well, we, we tend to do things like put uh, axes along planes of symmetry. I used to work in aerospace, so most of the time, the positive x direction went in the flow direction. So positive x would go from the nose of the airplane to the back along the center line of the plane. It was just a convenient uh, convention to use. So we'll, we'll, we'll base our coordinate systems on conventions probably. Um, we won't necessarily measure in those angles for a number of different reasons. We do when we can, but when we can't, we do this. And so we need to be able to transform those into these. Right? Well, fortunately, there's a very simple set of equations that does that. And these are just basically trig. And I'm going to write them all out quick. Now, I know there is nothing in the world more boring than watching the back of my head while I write this. So I'll make this as quick as I can. All right. And let me double check, make sure I got this right here. You can fast forward through this part if you want. I certainly wouldn't blame you. Oops. All right, so let's, let's, there's one of them. Let's, talk, let's look at what this means. There's epsilon A. There's the thing we're measuring using the strain gauge rosette. There's epsilon X. That's one of the things I want to find out. Epsilon Y, another thing I want to find out. And gamma XY, a third thing I want to find out. Well, cosine squared theta, that's just a number based on an angle. So is that, so is that. All right? So I've got three unknowns. So far, I've got one equation. Well, if the fundamental theorem of algebra is still right, I got to have two more equations. Well, that's why there's three gauges in the rosette. So we can solve these three equations. Somebody was thinking when they thought this up. Okay, this is pretty much my exercise for the day. Oh boy, there we go. There's the second equation. So if I got one more, which I do, I'll have three equations and three unknowns. Well, assuming those equations are not, one of them is not a copy of another one, maybe a disguised copy, but a copy of the other one, of any of the other ones, then I should be able to solve this. And it turns out these aren't. Now, physically what it means, if you want these to be three separate equations, not, one's not a copy of any of the others, what you need physically is you need those gauges to all be at different angles, and they are. In fact, you want the gauges to be as far apart angularly as you can get them. Well, 120 degrees is as far apart as you can get. Theoretically, you could go 0, 2 degrees, 4 degrees. If the, everything was right, there was no noise anywhere, all right, the signal to noise ratio was nice and high. But that's never true. Realistically, what would happen is the noise would drown out the differences. So even though Mathematically, you could do 0, 2, and 4 degree gauges. It would never work physically unless it, the circumstances were just absolutely ideal. Well, the way we deal with that is go 0, 120, 240. That's as far apart as they can get. All right? And that, that uh, makes us a pretty desirable set of gauges to use. By the way, I drew the gauge, the rosette, like that. It's kind of like a propeller, I suppose. There's no reason you couldn't place them like that. 
that's 0, 120, 240. They're saying the angles are the same. They're just placed a little differently with respect to one another. And the reason we, we can do this or that, we assume that the strains are very slowly across the area of this gauge into this rosette. Now, rosettes are sometimes that big. They're these little, little tiny things. They have to be small compared to the change in strain. If you have a very large structure where changes very slowly across the structure, you could have a rosette that big and it would be okay. But if you have a small part or a part where strains are varying quickly across the part, you need little itty bitty gauges so that you can assume that you're measuring strains at a point. Okay, that's the, one of the underlying assumptions here. So pick this however you want. We can rotate this. It doesn't really matter because you can put in whatever angles you want. All right. So we got this. I got three equations, three unknowns. We know that we're going to measure those, calculate those. We're set. Let me give you some numbers now to work with. I'm always happiest when I'm working with numbers. Being an engineer and not a mathematician, I guess maybe that's my bias. All right. So let's say that epsilon a is 100 microstrain. Epsilon B is minus 100 microstrain, and oops, Epsilon C is also 100 microstrain. Okay, now I'm just, obviously I'm just making these up, but let's say you measure these off of parts. Where these numbers could be anything, it doesn't change the way we solve the problem. All right, and let's see. Let's also say theta A equals zero degrees. Doesn't have to be. It can be anything. But whatever, whatever theta A is, theta B and theta C are pretty much determined now. And so that's going to be 120 degrees. And theta C equals 240 degrees. So if I have a gauge, you know, I can rotate it any way I want, just stick it on. All right. So what I'm going to do is fill up that, that, those equations. Now those equations, if you'll notice, the trig stuff just turns out to be numbers. Epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy are the things I want to, to uh, calculate. So what I can do is I can write this out in matrix form if I want, and I want. Now this is how I'm going to do this. Oops. Tell them in a hurry. I keep writing things wrong. I'm trying to keep this video short. I don't know if it's going to work. Okay, and I've got all this other stuff down here, and well, I shouldn't do that. Let's let's not. If you don't like this part, if this part gets boring, feel free to just uh, zoom past it here, fast forward past it. Okay, so there you can see this, these are the co the uh, uh, coefficients that were in those equations before. I'm writing the equation out very, very similarly, just in matrix form, okay? All right, so there we go. That stuff's all numbers. That's the stuff we want to know. That's the numbers we've measured, okay? Measured these. We know these just because of the angles on the different gauges in the rosette. That's what we want to find out. Well, if I called that B, maybe that M, and that x, boy, that sure looks like a matrix equation to me. Now, if you don't know what matrices are, don't let that freak you out. You could go to that, the earlier problem where I, that I had written out and solve it using substitution if you like. Mathematically, exactly the same thing. You'll get exactly the same answer. Not a problem. But if you do happen to know what matrices are, that's what I'm going to do here in a second. All right? So let me just erase this all because i got this little board here, and I'll write out the numbers for you. Um, well, let's see. You got all this stuff. Okay. Now, remember, we're working in microstrain. I put microstrain in, I'm going to get microstrain out. So let me just write the numbers out for you. Okay. So 100 minus 100, 100 equals 100. Remember, the first gauge is lined up along the x-axis, so I'd better get some, some, some ones and zeros in there and not much else. Oops, wrong one here. 
Okay, I'll tell you what about these in a second. Yeah. Okay, one zero zero makes sense because gauge one is lined up along the x-axis. Doesn't need to be. Happens to be in this point. Okay, now notice these two are the same except for the signs there. Well, that makes sense because the other two gauges are symmetric above and below the x-axis. Above, below. All right, that makes sense. All righty, so all i got to do is invert that, and I'm going to say now that epsilon x, epsilon y, gamma xy is the inverse of that times that. Well, the inverse here, do this right here. better. Okay, inverse of that. I'm going to write that, write at that out for you so in case you're checking this from where you are. You can make sure you're getting the same numbers I got. stuff I want to know. There, this is the inverse of m. That thing right there is m to the minus 1. Okay? There's the, the uh, measured strains and the ones I want to calculate are 100 minus 33.33 which is uh, 100 times a third. There you go. So those are in micro strain. Now we've got all the numbers we need here. We started with measured numbers, epsilon A, epsilon B, epsilon C, looked at the orientation of the gauges, and we're able to calculate epsilon X, epsilon Y, gamma XY. There you go.